Twilight Cleric. <laughs> this one's gonna be very fun. So Twilight Cleric comes from Tashes, and usually in these videos I tell you the things that are good and things that are bad. But this subclass is actually perfect in every single feature. I'm literally not joking. It's actually overpowered. Welcome to Pack Tactics, where Shadowheart should have been a Twilight Cleric. It would have been insanely overpowered if she was, but you know. It makes sense for her character to be an actual Twilight Cleric. Okay, so again, this subclass literally has no bad or weak features at all. The closest we get is Divine Strike, but even that is just a boon. Moving on, Twilight Domain spells, aka the spells they get automatically prepared. Without counting against your total number of prepared spells, some spells here are normally cleric spells, others aren't. And these unique spells you get here are really, really good. Sleep is just insane at low levels. Fun fact, sleep was my first ever video I made. I think by the time this video comes out, it's the third anniversary for that video. Gator, we're literally three years old now. Cobalt, we're getting old. Yeah, we're getting really old, but there's gonna be a birthday cake. Yay, cake. Sorry about that, now I'm wasting your time. So, wizards are usually the strongest character at level 1 because sleep is just an encounter ender. However, they're actually quite squishy at level 1. Like, if your DM doesn't allow you to rest cast, then even getting your mage armor might be a problem. Here with this cleric, you don't need to worry about that because you get medium armor and shield proficiency right off the bat. I personally think one level in Twilight Cleric is the strongest first level build in the game, and it can even be the strongest tier 1 build in the whole game. I made a short about that entire build, I'm super proud of it. Fairy Fire is pretty good too, but it is, for the most part, a worse option compared to Bless. Bless is just better. I wouldn't dismiss it, it's nice to have in your back pocket because it can counter invisibility, but nothing really crazy. Moonbeam and Sea Invisibility are not the best options, but you might find some moments. Aura of Vitality is a huge spell, but it's a bit expensive for my liking. Still though, it's very useful to have. Tiny Hut? I don't think I've ever talked about Tiny Hut. Tiny Hut is one of those really crazy spells. It's a fantastic spell and can really break games, but let's not talk about that aspect. If you have a wizard in your party, then I would say this is largely useless. Fourth level spells aren't all that crazy, but Circle of Power and Mislead are really good. The former is a Paladin exclusive, similar to Holy Aura, but instead of it being an 8th level spell, it's a 5th level spell. And then you have Mislead. This allows you to, without any danger to your own body, scout out an entire dungeon. This spell even implies that it's intangible, so you could even go through walls with it. So yeah, you get the point now. This is a really good list. You know what's also really good? Describe. They have a massive catalog with music, sound effects, maps, and descriptions. Perfect for DMs who want a massive growing catalog that will last for years. Describe is always innovating, and right now they're working on Opus, which is a web app that basically lets you combine a ton of ambience, music, and sound effects together to enhance immersion. Let's give it a test drive. Let's say the parties in the swamp taking a long rest. We can play this. Then later, as they're taking the rest, a storm picks up, so we play this. The players decide to cancel the long rest due to the storm? Okay, they ride their cart into the night. You can just keep on adding more and more sounds or music or whatever. There's also already made collections that come with ambience and descriptions that you can build off of easily. And together with their maps, you can string a lot of things together, which makes your DMing job a million times easier. Opus is in beta, and it's currently free. This is the perfect opportunity to give it a try. I love this feature. I think it's brilliant. I highly recommend you check out Describe, and if you want to take it a step further for the full catalog, use the code PACTACTICS for 10% off your first 
subscription payments. I'll be playing their music through this entire video from now on. Back to the video. Now we get into the proper features. Well, spells are features, but you know what I mean. Eyes of the Knights. You get this at level 1. You can see through the deepest gloom. You have dark vision out to a range of 300 feet. In that radius, you can see in dim light as if it were bright light, and in darkness as if it were dim light. As an action, you can magically share the dark vision of this feature with willing creatures you can see within 10 feet of you, up to a number of creatures equal to your wisdom modifier. The shared dark vision lasts for an hour. Once you share it, you can't do so again until you finish a long rest, unless you expend a spell slot of any level to share it again. Now, I'm not the type that cares too much about dark vision. Like, even if I didn't have dark vision, I'll buy a bullseye lantern. I'm a really big bullseye lantern enjoyer. But you can also see that I'm a kobold, and I really enjoy traveling at night. And convincing your party to travel at night is kind of hard sometimes. And this is really, really good. 300 feet dark vision. And your party gets the same thing for an hour. With range, you can easily take advantage of this and really hurt the enemies. Let's say you're fighting enemies with 60 foot dark vision, for example. If you're out of their 60 foot dark vision, you have advantage to your attacks. Because remember, you have 300 foot dark vision, and so does your party. They can all take advantage of this. And the enemies with 60 foot dark vision, they might have disadvantage if they can't see you. But you can clearly see them. I don't think the devs even thought about this when they made this feature. Usually when it comes to features like this, they're pretty tame. But here they just cranked it up. It doesn't feel like it's official, it feels like homebrew. It's crazy good. But that's not the only first level feature they get. They also get another one, and this one's crazy too. Vigilant Blessing. The knight has taught you to be vigilant. As an action, you can give one creature you touch, including possibly yourself, advantage on the next initiative roll the creature makes. This benefit ends immediately after you roll or if you use this feature again. Initiative is so powerful. Going first is one of the best things you can do. Ah, the goblins haven't moved yet and they're all grouped up? Ah, perfect for sleep, skadoosh. Now they have to spend multiple rounds to recover. Maybe they won't recover at all because my friends are doing stuff to them too. You would think like the three 300 foot dark vision to everyone for an hour would be enough, but no. But wait, hold on, there's something I forgot. There's more! You also get heavy armor proficiency! <laughs> what the f? I kind of forgot about that. Cobalt, stop swearing! Sorry about that, Gator. Anyways, now at level 2, you get the most powerful feature. Twilight Sanctuary. You can use your channel divinity to refresh your allies with soothing twilight. As an action, you present your holy symbol, and a sphere of twilight emanates from you. The sphere is centered on you, has a 30-foot radius, and is filled with dim lights. The sphere moves with you, and it lasts for one minute, or until you are incapacitated, or die. Whenever a creature, including you, ends its turn in the sphere, you can grant the creature one of these benefits. 1. You grant temporary HP equal to 1d6 plus your cleric level. 2. You end one effect on it, causing it to be charmed or frightened. I've done a video on Artillerist Artificer. A little bit of a background on that. They also have a feature that generates temporary HP. It's a 1d8 plus intelligence modifier in a 10 foot radius as a bonus action. What it is is a little cannon, and it lasts until it dies. When it dies, you have to Wait until a long rest or spend more resources to get it back. Twilight Sanctuary, on the other hand, can be used every short rest and has a 30 foot radius! It's massive! Look how big it is! And that's not all, it can even remove harmful effects like Charmed or Frightened, something similar to what Devotion Paladins can do at level 7. But Kobold, I thought this aura only gave 1d8 temporary HP. Gator, I'm dead serious here. That is in the UA version, the playtest version. They buffed the aura by a ton after the playtest, and nobody knows why. It's crazy. 
Nobody thought the Twilight Cleric in the UA was weak. Literally no one. I remember on day one when Tashes came out, literally everyone was talking about Twilight Cleric. Anyways, incredibly powerful temporary HP generator with an added on bonus. That bonus can literally counter Dragon's Frightful Presence, I'm not joking. It can even counter Hypnotic Pattern entirely. This is like secretly a ninth level feature, I'm literally not joking. Next, at level 6, they get flights. What the heck? Cobalt, you must be joking! No, I'm not joking. Step of the Night says you can draw on the mystical power of the night to rise into the air. As a bonus action, when you are in dim light or darkness, you can magically give yourself a flying speed equal to your walking speed for one minute. You can use this bonus action a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus, and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. Flying is really strong, but this is actually stronger than normal flight. This is magical flight. I made a short about it a long time ago. You can go prone in the air without falling. What that means is not only can the melee enemies not get you because you're in the air, but the ranged enemies also have disadvantage because you're prone in the air. By the way, yes, I know this sounds really stupid, but sometimes raw is just like this. Your DM is most likely gonna rule against this. I would rule against it. Absolutely. I don't think this is an intended mechanic. Kobold, I'm Super Gator. Whee! Okay, so let's get serious now. It is worth asking your DM if that Twilight Sanctuary is replacing a light condition with dim lights or only adding dim lights. If it is the former, using Twilight Sanctuary sets up your ability to fly. Either way, it doesn't really matter too much because getting that flight is pretty easy. At level 8, they get to do more damage through Divine Strike. This is nothing special, you're familiar with this. And finally, at level 17, their Twilight Sanctuary gets buffed. The Twilight that you summon offers a protective embrace. You and your allies have half cover while in the sphere created by your Twilight Sanctuary. So what this is, is plus 2 to AC and dexterity saving throws to you and your allies. This is a pretty powerful capstone, because remember, Twilight Sanctuary is a 30 foot radius. This is gonna protect all of your friends, or at least most of your friends. Is this feature necessary? Probably not, but it is a capstone, so I do think it's deserved. This subclass is seriously way too strong, like it's super overpowered. I don't think anybody denies that. If you were to analyze subclasses exclusively, this is the strongest subclass in the entire game at all tiers. It's a perfect subclass. There's only like one subclass that's kinda close to this, but for a very different reason. What this feels like is somebody at Wizards of the Coast really, really loved the concept. So they wanted to make it really, really powerful. You know, they're picking favorites. But who knows what actually happened in the office that day. It's a mystery. Now, some of you might ask, would I ban this? No, I don't think banning this will solve anything. I do understand why you would. And there's some things that I ban too, like I ban planar binding. But I don't think this is like planar binding level of crazy. Anyways, overpowered. I talked a little bit about this in my how to DM for optimizers video. The thing is, if the players play well as a team, they can handle extreme days or extreme encounters anyways. They don't need to be a Twilight Cleric to achieve extreme playstyles like that, although it certainly helps. Like, it makes it easier. The benefit to overpowered players as a DM is you get to be more experimental with your encounters. You just just throw things that you think are interesting, and if they crush them, well, who cares? Another benefit is you get to focus more on the story, which is the best option, I would say. The story is the heart of the game. They came to roleplay. That's why they're playing the game. I think that's really important to keep in mind. The story is more important than the balance. But if you choose to ban this, that's completely fine. Like, I don't have authority over your table. Anyways, players, if you are able to play this 
amazingly overpowered subclass. I recommend the flagship cleric on tabletop builds, link down below. This is seriously one of the strongest cleric builds you could ever play. Anyways, that's the end of the video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope I earned your subscription. And if I didn't earn it, then don't subscribe. Then I have to optimize in a different way. Anyways, Gator, is there anything you want to say? Yeah! Boop -a -doop -boop 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 boop 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 boop